I appreciate that. Um, I'm glad that y'all had a few times to work it out. It really felt like y'all meant it that time when you stood up before I came up. Uh, hope makes all the difference. Hope makes all the difference. Uh, one sociologist defined hope like this. Hope is um, the feeling that the feeling you have right now isn't permanent. I've been on a sabbatical for my church for the past uh, month, and my past month has been spent working on a dissertation and potty training my daughter. Um, and it's crazy how wide of a spectrum hopelessness uh, can find you on. There's no thing that you do that exempts you from being hopeless. And there's nothing more obvious to everybody. Hope makes all the difference. Researchers did a study a few years ago where they tried to find the effects of hope on people that are undergoing hardship. So what they did was they took these two sets of rats and they put each of the rats in pools of water and had them swim. With the first group, they picked them up periodically and put them right back in. With the next group, they left them alone. That first group of rats swam for over 24 hours. The last group drowned within an hour. What changed? Hope. Even rats know that, hey, if I can just hold on a little longer, somebody may come and get me. And where there's hope, people move. Hope makes all the difference. It brings perseverance. The world doesn't just know that to be true. You know this to be true. Your whole life is spent trying to find hope. Every job interview you go to, every conference, every time you go out on a date, every month with your spouse that you make fertility plans, every time you daydream, do you know what you do? You hope. And although your life spent trying to find hope, every one of your frustrations come because you haven't found it. You know what it's like to get let go from a job. You know what it's like to have the first date and not have any more. You know what it's like to come to the end of the month and to find out your fertility plans didn't work. You know what it's like not to have daydreams, but nightmares. And what you quickly find out is that tragedies never destroy people or communities. Hopelessness does. Tragedies are normal and they set folks back. Hopelessness, what it does is people that are set back, it makes sure that they don't get back up. It's not sad and disappointed people that riot. It is despondent and hopeless people that riot. Hope makes all the difference. And the crazy thing about hope is this. The harder that you search for it, the harder it is to find it. The good news that I have is that hope never comes about as a result of your hard work. I would wager that nobody in this room has ever found hope as a result of the hard work that you put in. Here's the good news. You never find hope. That's not how hope works. You don't find hope. Hope finds you. Hope is not a destination. It is something that is Amazon primed to your doorstep. If you grew up and you had two parents in your household, you grew up and you had three square meals per day. You grew up and you had a support system of people that supported your dreams. Do you know what you had? You had this security that was built in you to where every day you woke up, you woke up to a realistic hope. Hope is a gift. It comes to unlikely people in the most unlikely places, in the most unlikely packages. Hope found me this month 17 years ago when I was robbed at gunpoint with my family on a dirt road in the Nigerian countryside. At 18 years old, before I had a chance to go to college to find out how I was going to spend my life, 
We got delivered from robbers, and a man came out of nowhere and put us back on track. We get our passports and plane tickets the next day and go back home, and I got a second chance to live life before I wasted my first one. I didn't ask for it. I never would have, but I'm grateful for it. And it shaped me because 17 years ago, I learned that the best use of my life, the best use of your life, is to prepare people that are following you to live in this world without you. Hope is a gift. It's a great gift that completely changes perspective. Years ago, a salesman sent two men into a remote town to sell shoes. The first guy comes back and says this, turn back, nobody here wears shoes. The next guy says, this is a gold mine. Nobody here has shoes. Both of them saw the same thing, but what changed? The first person saw the characteristics of the community that he was in. They don't put shoes on their feet. The next person didn't see obstacles, he saw opportunity. He saw, although the characteristics are different from where I come from, most people here have the same capacity to wear shoes than they do there. It's an opportunity. And so I want you to know throughout the course of these next few days, uh, if hope has not found you, hope will find you. And you're going to hear stories and you're going to be inspired by the way that hope has found people that come to present to you. But one thing that I love about plywood, one thing that I love about these three days is that hope has found you, but that's only half of the story. Um, hope has found you on its way to somebody else. One thing that I've learned is that most gifts um, aren't to be re-gifted. Have you ever had the unfortunate experience um, of re-gifting a personalized gift to somebody else in the presence of the person that gave you that gift? Right, where you give this personalized painting and talk about how much you love the person that you're going to give this to, and the person that gave you that painting is standing there in the same room. Uh, most gifts, it's an insult to re-gift them. Hope is not the same way. The giver of hope is honored when people re-gift it. Hope is a gift that's meant to be re-gifted, and I just really wanted to make sure that we all have that framework as I welcome you here into the West End. There's a whole lot to love about the West End. All right, I've lived here in the West End for about uh, five years, and what drew me to the West End uh, is that when I first came in, it felt like a cookout every day, right? So it's like you come in here to the West End and you drive around, and what you see is everybody has a front porch. But if you live here in Atlanta, what you see is that, well, Everybody in Atlanta has a front porch. But I feel like that the West End is unique. In all the other places in Atlanta that I've lived in, people have a front porch, but their front porch kind of feels like the fine china at home. Did y'all grow up in homes like I did where you had this china, and it was these plates, but it was behind this, this force field of glass, right? And it was for really important folks that came around, and I'm 35 years old, and nobody important enough has come to our house <laughs> for us to bring out that fine china. Our china hasn't smelled a turkey leg in 35 years. <laughs> if you walk through the West End, what you'll find out is that the front porch is not like fine china. It's like uh, when I grew up, we didn't go to Ikea to get our uh, glassware. Uh, when we went to get food from fast food spots, uh, we would order the extra sized drinks because it came in a sturdy plastic cup. And those were the cups that we used to drink out of. And let me tell you, those cups got used and used and used until the logo on the front was worn out. And it didn't matter who you were, important, non-important, white, black, rich, poor, old, young, you were brought in and that became a space for you to partake. That's what the porches at the West End are like. What you'll find in the community that I live in is you'll find a hospitality that sheds new light on the fatherlessness and the broken families that political pundits will weaponize against the community that I live in. 
what you'll find is that we are a community uh, that we don't uh, reduce family to the shallow definition of blood ties. We're a community where regardless of who you are or the background that you come from, come on up to the front porch. Drink out of the plastic way that we have. We're not going to pull out the fine china, uh, but we want you to know that you're welcome. We don't just use our front porch, uh, but we don't have a white picket fence in the front yard, and that's because we don't view ourselves as a collection of individuals. Uh, in the West End, we're a village, and what you find in a village is that when products are scarce, you're forced to share. And hear this, as you share, not just out of being nice, but out of necessity, you find and learn this truth. We live in a world that says uh, commitment comes out of love. I love somebody, and therefore I commit. But that is backwards, y'all. Uh, uh, love is actually produced by commitment. That it's in committing to a group of people that you start to find this love. Think of every deep relationship that you have, and I promise you, it is not commitment List. Commitment has a way of producing this love. And I want you to know, if you cross the street, you'll taste it. There's a type of knowing that you can have as I tell you how good it is. Uh, but there's another type of knowing that comes as you taste it. At a cookout, I can tell you how good the ribs are. Uh, but there's a different kind of knowing that comes when you lick that last little bit of sweet baby rays off that pinky finger. <laughs> so I want you to taste it. So I want you to think of your time here in the course of the next few days uh, as your time at a black cookout. Judging by the audience here, I'm not a betting man, but I would wager most of us don't frequent black cookouts. <laughs> um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the two most important commands. The first one is this. Uh, bring something. Uh, uh, you do not show up to a black cookout and don't bring nothing. That is the quickest way to get excommunicated. Um, and the reason why I say that is this. Um, plenty of folks have come to our community uh, and don't bring anything, but they take. Uh, the mortgage fraud that crippled the economy hit our zip code just as hard, if not harder, than any other place in the United States. This community has been hit by years of discrimination, political oppression, people ignoring problems. We found that it's been um, easy to create a diverse room when people want to withdraw our treasures, but the rooms become real segregated uh, when we want to find some place to deposit our tears. So all I'm saying is bring something. And you may say, well, John, you've already pulled my card. I haven't been to a black cookout. Uh, what do I bring? That rule one is bring something. Rule two is this. Uh, bring something that everybody wants and needs. <laughs> the greatest present that you can give us is your presence. So five years ago, we moved here and we bought a home and we planted roots because we found out that compassion um, is kind of like Bluetooth headphones, right? Uh, it needs proximity to connect. You can't mail in compassion. Um, so what we're saying is we want you to feel welcome, not just in the course of three days, but to spend time here, to walk the streets, during the daytime, of course, right? But yeah, we still want you to walk the streets here. Uh, if you're not ready to move in there, I know that's a big jump. Here's a few other things that you can do. Uh, you can advocate for people that are tired of advocating for themselves. There's plenty of ways for you to get involved. Thirdly is this, um, empathy. Uh, if you don't know what to do or what to bring or when to come or what to do, when you're here, just come and listen, because uh, we love to talk and to speak and to share and to bring you up on the porch 
and to get to know you, and hopefully you'll uh, get to know us. And if uh, you want to know more, Google the name Robert Thompson or come back and find me. Robert is a guy that's lived here four years, and he gives tours about the West End, and you walk with him for one afternoon, um, and you'll never see this community in the same way. So with that, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. All of you have a gift that has been given to you, and that is the gift of hope. And so I want you to re-gift it. Walk across the street. All right, y'all have a great time. I'm done. <laughs>